Hello, welcome to jasonnewland.com. My name is Jason Newland and this is Relaxation Hypnosis for Stress, Anxiety and Panic Attacks. Please only listen when you can safely close your eyes. Please subscribe and if you'd like to uh, send me a PayPal gift, please go to paypal.me forward slash Jason Newland and the link's on my website. Now, I'd like to talk about brain, <laughs> I know I'm laughing at this, brain plasticity. Uh, it's part of me a little bit worried that I might not pronounce it correctly. Brain plasticity. Now, not everybody listening to this may know what it means, and I didn't know what it meant until probably about a year ago. So, what it means basically is the ability that there's okay, you know, there's the old term that you know you can't teach an old dog new tricks, or uh, what is the other one? A leopard never changes its spots, or that's the equivalent with there's no smoke without fire. They're just pathetic sayings that are meaningless. Um, just passed on from generation to generation with based on people's horrible experiences or just regurgitating what they've heard. Now, I understand some people would say, well, there's no... Uh, a leopard doesn't change his spots if they've experienced someone uh, and had a really, really horrible time with someone, you know, and they thought they'd changed and they hadn't. I can understand how that would, because it taints our minds, doesn't it? It taints the way we see the world when sometimes when really horrible things happen. So I can understand that thinking, but it's incorrect in the sense of we all change, but not everybody changes the way that we would like them to change. And some people are our souls when they're 16 and they're still our souls when they're 60. That is true. There are some people like that. And some people are lovely when they're 16 and there are souls when they're 70. Some people are horrible when they're 16, 17 and they're lovely by the time they get to 30. You know, they've grown out of it. They've, they've changed. Some people are lovely most of the time. But given some circumstances, they're horrible. They might have a horrible job going debt collecting and be vicious. But when they go home, they're loving to their family. And they're a, you know, church church going person and might be lovely. But, you know, when they're doing that job, they're not. So we're always changing. And someone that decides to keep hold of that kind of aggression and you know it's the choice they've chosen to do it whatever reason even if they think that it's not a choice as we know everything is a choice as far as everything changes you choose what you do next and it don't matter people can argue all the light all of you know, I can't help what I do next now when I say people choose what they do next I'm not talking about someone that's going through a, a mental breakdown course the person someone's got um, going through a neurotic time I'm not talking about those extreme situations I'm talking about general life I can't cover all angles I can't cover all uh, possible scenarios although I do try to in my brain but it's not realistic I'm talking about the general population we choose what we do next, even if we don't believe it, we do. And it's annoying to be told that. I know it is. It's annoying, I get annoyed. Even when I say it to myself, it annoys me a little bit. What do you mean, actually, I have to do this, I've got no choice. You know, I've got someone coming around at, I don't know, at half twelve today. 
and I didn't know they were going to want to come into the flat. There's, this is a friend meeting me, but I've not tidied up or anything. And now I feel that I have to let them in to my messy flat because Andre's messy and I blame everything on him, even though a lot of the mess is mine. But in my mind, I think I've got no choice. Even if I say, as I say it to you, I'm feeling like a victim. I've got no choice. I have to let them in and it's going to be embarrassing and degrading. And well, I do have a choice. I could tidy the flat, which I'm not going to. I could not answer the door, which I'm not going to. I could phone them up and say I could rearrange and meet them somewhere else, which I might do, actually. But there's a choice. I don't have to let them in. I don't have to answer the phone. So there's always a choice. It's just, it feels uncomfortable because... You know, I like, I don't know, there's something very familiar about being, being the victim sometimes in a sense of like, you know, not able to be, oh, it's being done to me. Life is being done to me. They're coming into my flat and it's, it's, you know, like, please feel sorry for me. Yeah, there's no one to feel sorry for me. So I want to feel sorry for myself. And there's, there's something quite nice about feeling sorry for myself. And it's probably something really unhealthy about it as well. It's definitely not useful. It's nice sometimes to do that, to get in touch, I think, to the reality. I mean, someone told me yesterday about something that happened to them that also happened to me. And I didn't say anything. All I said is, yeah, I know what you mean. I didn't say I relate to what you're saying or I understand what you're saying. I understand what it's like. I just said, yeah, I hear you. I understand. I, um, yeah. And I was feeling it. And whether or not that was feeling sorry for myself, it didn't feel that way. It felt more like I was getting in touch with that part of me that, okay. It was like a reminder that it's not, I'm not the only one that's had, that's, it's happened to. And also the other people, some other people are way more open than I am. And I'm, look, I'm doing these recordings and this person was way more open about that particular thing which I'm not going to go into at all, obviously, but but then I suppose in a way I wouldn't talk about it because it doesn't really fit in with this podcast necessarily. Anyway, brain plasticity. I keep having to bring myself back to brain plasticity. Bring it back, bring it back, JJ. So what does it, the idea is that we've all, I guess, been brought up to think that we learn when we're kids and the older you get, the harder it is to learn and the brain changes, the brain kind of, the idea that the brain just stays, it deteriorates over time and that's it. But luckily we're born with so many billions of neuron connections or whatever that we've got loads and loads and loads. We're born with a lifetime supply and more to keep us going for 80 or 90 years so if you live to be 90 your brain's not going to be working as well as it did when you was younger even if you've got no physical illnesses or any kind of um, anything if, you know, if you're physically and mentally well is still, you know, the brain is going to be deteriorating as it were the body, just naturally through age. Not many 90-year-olds do marathons. I guess some do, but not many. 
And I noticed that with my nan, her brain slowed down. And her body kind of just shut down with old age. When she hit about 95. And she wasn't remembering things the way she used to. But there wasn't anything wrong with her. It was, she was just, it was, she was coming to the end. Because of, of, of her age, really, basically. Just old age. And just old age. So the idea that we can't learn anything new. Well, first of all, that's wrong. It's ridiculous. It, and we all know it's ridiculous because we're always learning new things, aren't we? Always. You've learned new things this week. Something you never knew before. But you might not know what it is. You know, it might, it might be something you saw on television. might be something you read in a book, in a magazine. Something you overheard on the bus. It's like, you know, if, on a movie. It just... In, you know, it's just something. A new thing. Maybe it's something you learn about yourself. Something that you're capable of doing. So I realised about myself earlier. The eight times table. No. Yeah, the eight times table. I remembered how to do it. And it might seem like well, kind of yeah, a small child can do that. But yeah, fair enough. But it's not something I think about. And I just remembered yesterday. I just kind of recalled the way to do it. So adding eight. So it's basically the next would be 18 take away two. So 16. And next would be 26 take away two. 24. And it's like basically up 10, but down two, the last, you know? And it's like, oh, that's quite a nice feeling. Not quite as interested in saying it out loud as I thought it was when I was thinking about it, but that's okay. So plasticity, basically the discovery of this really was for people with strokes, brain injuries. They realized that someone with a stroke maybe loses the it's quite well known, isn't it? They might lose part of the movement in half of their body. Um, and then they learn through physiotherapy to, to use that part of the body again. See, the people who were doing this, who were doing the physiotherapy and for years and years, they didn't really know what was going on inside the brain. They didn't realise that parts of the brain that weren't even for moving the right hand or moving the left, left arm or left leg were being used. Like the brain was plastic. The brain was able to um, transform itself and grow in a different way in order to help the person to use the other part of the body to help to get speech back and to help it was just and they started you know doing brain scans on people because that's the only way to know what's going on in the brain is to actually look at the brain which took psychologists and psychiatrists over a hundred years to figure out bless them well over 100 years, yeah, 1900, 2000, well, it's 2020 now, so yeah, yeah, well over 100 years before they realised that the organ that they were actually <laughs> studying perhaps needed to be looked at. But of course they didn't have the technology back then in, you know, Freud's time. And but yeah, now they can just put this helmet on, can't they? And they can put a helmet on your head, and they can see which part of your brain is being activated, and they can get you to think about something, and they can see what part of your brain is being activated. 
So I suppose an example would be if you had problems with moving your right hand. So, you know, go and move your right hand. You might have minimal movement in your right hand. So they'll, you say, move your right hand and they'll see the part of your brain that's being activated. And then they can send electric shocks, like gentle electric probes into the brain from outside, and it's not intrusive. And they can stimulate that part of the brain so that it grows, so that it stimulates, so that it develops. So maybe that person can start using more of their hand, be able to have more control over the movement of their right hand. Now this is a very simplistic view because I'm not a psychiatrist or psychologist. I've not got, I'm not a doctor. So, you know, I'm giving a very basic, my basic understanding of it. But the other understanding is with the plasticity of the brain, it means that we can change. It's not, we don't want to say, uh, we're changing, we're always changing. It's not just a bunch of words. It's true. We are changing, our brains are changing all the time. So, if from that perspective, hypnosis, focusing, hearing a new idea, taking it on, changing the way that you think opens up a new neural path, a neural network, and it changes things. I like to think of it in a sense of, you know, cutting through a forest. You know the old the old movies, like Tarzan, and you know, they'd cut through the forest to make a um, a little pathway because it was always full of bush and branches and stuff. But once the pathway's made, then other people start using that pathway, and eventually, it goes gets worn down, so nothing grows due in that pathway. Well, that's kind of, in my head, how that new connection is, how a new connection would be in your mind, to take you straight to a place, instead of to the place where it was. So maybe instead of, uh, when you think about, for example, going to a party, instead of your brain going into, oh, there's going to be all them people there, I don't feel very good even thinking about it. This is going to be, no, I don't want to be there. There's going to be all these people. Um, that someone's going to want me to talk to them. Um, you know, those feelings. You could build a new pathway which goes straight through to a feeling of, yeah, I'll be all right or straight to the part part of your brain which is not bothered about stuff. It's almost like redirecting the river, I guess. Stopping the overflow. Because the overflow you could class as the anxiety, the flooding. And let's, let's face it, flooding causes anxiety and stress for anyone that has to deal with it. It's a lot of flooding in my country at the moment. And luckily, we do have flooding in this area, but it's the countryside. It's not actually, it doesn't flood the houses. But it's, uh, so if you think of that flooding as being the anxiety. So you redirect the river to a different place, which then prevents the flooding. So in a sense, it might not even matter where you redirect it to because the overall sense of anxiety reduces or goes away because you've redirected that river of that flood. That rising water is now reducing. So yeah, I mean, you think about it, all the different 
uh, London, uh, Rome, Amsterdam, just to name a few, places where there's canals uh, that, you know, just the way it's been able to build around that and actually make use of that. So instead of um, being flooded, all these things are being built that can then be used for transporting goods on boats. So there's a lot of things that plasticity can do. I mean, it's still quite young in its kind of knowledge basis. There's, there are experts, obviously, on everything, but it's still in its infancy, really, as far as psychology and psychotherapy and psychiatry and all that stuff goes. But the fact is the brain can grow. There was a lady, saw a documentary, there was a lady and she had, I can't remember what she had, um, what condition she had, but it was, I think it was due to a stroke. And they did a, a test, they gave her a brain scan, they could see the parts of her brain where there was holes, and it's not holes in the way that we think of it, but they could see that there's different grey matter and stuff and they could see where the brain had been damaged so what they did is they put the old um, electrode thing on and sent some elect electronic I don't know what it's called vibes or whatever it is it, it goes click 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 like that anyway it's not a good example but they sent that stimulated the brain part and over a, over a short while, she started to recover. Because the brain started to grow. And the brain scan after, I don't know how many weeks it was of treatment she had. But the brain scan afterwards showed that that part of the brain had grown back. And how amazing is that? And we don't need electronic equipment for this to happen. That's the thing. The way we think causes it to happen. For the average person out there, and you know, I'm not talking about someone that's had a stroke, although someone told me recently, they sent me a message saying that they'd had a stroke and listening to me had really helped them. So... You, the brain changes depending on what you do and how you think and I keep reminding myself of this because it's so important what we do what we think about what we say affects our brain and that's a lot of pressure sometimes so I think it's important not to put the pressure on yourself to try and, you know, be gentle. That's why being gentle is so important because otherwise you'd be like a sergeant major following yourself around all the time, telling yourself off and criticising yourself and that's the complete opposite to what we need. We just need gentle reminders. Gentle reminders. Purposeful thinking. But gentle has so important. I mean, people might disagree with me. I don't care if they do, but I think being gentle is just so important. Being gentle towards yourself, being gentle towards other people. It changes things. It really makes a difference. And as we're only really, the only thing we've got any real control over is our own minds we can't control other people's behaviour but we can control our own we're, it, we're in charge of our own behaviour aren't we we're the, we're the boss we're responsible you 
you know, no one else is responsible for us other than us once we're adults. As children, of course, we adults are responsible for us, you know, our caregivers, the teachers. In fact, I think all adults should take responsibility for all children in a sense of looking out for them, making sure they're safe. You know, if, if you're an adult, you see a little kid fall over on the street crying, if there's no other adult about, you'd make sure the kid was okay, wouldn't you? So I kind of think that it's an adult's responsibility, a healthy, able-bodied adult responsibility to look after all vulnerable people, whatever age they are. And to look after the elderly. That's just my opinion anyway. It's got nothing to do with the recording. But being gentle. But thinking those things is gentle. It feels it feels a bit mushy. It does feel a bit... Ew. It's a bit mushy. It's a bit... Ew, you know? But I don't mind. Because... If you spend time with people that are really got extreme thought, extreme views that are quite harsh, whether it be race, whether it be religion, whether it be politics, um, whether it be towards the opposite sex, whether it be towards the same sex, whether it be feminism, whether it be whatever, some people who've got extreme views... can have and it's a mindset and that's a sign of someone that has um, less plasticity in their brain that's a sign of someone that's not growing their brain they're not this is an expert saying this not me this is someone that actually focuses on hate they're actually that's what they, they're a, a doctor and they devote their life to studying hate and extreme thought. And they say it's black, and, it's black and white thinking. And someone like that, they haven't developed their brain in order to think, um, well, logically or to be able to see another person's point of view. And it's just about they haven't developed it. So their brain is less less plastic in the sense of it's not being used, you know? It almost comes a bit hard. A bit like plasticine. You know? if, you ever, if you ever had plasticine before when you was a kid, and if you, if you like keep kneading it, it's nice and soft, and it can get really nice and soft, but if you leave it for a while it gets hard you can get it soft again though plasticine brain plasticity we should call it plasticine E so that person with the black and white thinking can have their brain softened so that they can start to see other people as human beings, to start to see other views. Don't have to agree with someone else's view, but just see it, hear it, acknowledge it as being a view. And that person starts to change inside. So that's kind of, and this is, Partly, I think the reason for this is because someone with extreme views will focus on that. Will focus on gaining information that backs up their personal belief system. So if someone thinks that a certain race is less intelligent than their race, and then they will find as much information as they can to back up their belief. 
even though there is no information that can back up that belief, but you know, in their mind, there's information and there's websites and books and magazines full of people that are devoted their life to being, you know, racist and hateful. I don't know, I'm laughing at that. It just seems so ridiculous. You think people would have more to do with their life, wouldn't you? And so there's that kind of thing where you've got the, the hate. People have got a lot of hate in them. They're focused on that. They're focused on those things. Which means their brains are less pliable. Their brains are less manipulative, manipulable, whatever you want to call it. You know, it's less plastic, basically. Although I do like the plasticine, plasticine, plasticine analogy. It's the same with bread as well. I've worked in bakeries. Bread is the softest thing in the world, you know, dough. But if you leave it, you leave it overnight, you come back, it ain't soft no more. So, you know, it's, but it can be. You know, you just need to go back and start kneading it. You might have to add a bit more water. You might have to do a little bit of work. And it might not really, you know, as far as food-wise be any good, but you could still get it back to that plasticity. And you probably could turn it back into a, a bread. I don't know what the rules are. You know, it's hygienically probably not, but... So those of us that aren't stuck in that um, hate-filled mindset means that we can see other people's points of view. doesn't mean we've got to agree with it. In fact, we can't, we can't agree with everybody. And there was, a, there was a politician, a prime minister called David Cameron. Uh, every time someone would say something, or say yeah I agree and then he'd disagree with them but he always agreed with them and then he said something else that was different which is very strange very strange way of doing it it's almost like I guess trying to uh, get the other person to drop their guard maybe so maybe it was very clever so he didn't go straight in as I disagree with what you're saying he said you know I agree with that I agree with what you said there and he did it constantly and I used to sort of watch him and thought it was because oh. no, most other politicians don't seem to do that they're very much they like to be confrontational for whatever reason perhaps it makes them look good or they think it makes them look good but then if you think about that part of the person uh, you know the things that we think in our mind about ourselves you know for example I'll use myself as an example that I'm stupid that I'm useless that I'm point you know whatever that I'm stupid completely stupid mentally which is what I used to think about myself and I used to notice examples that backed it up and there was lots of examples of times when I did some silly things. We've all got those examples, haven't we? Except some people use those examples as a funny story to tell. I used it as an example of my stupidity. So gathering information that backs up your opinion and your belief is a natural human process I guess it seems to be a natural thing that we do I mean with someone of a racist or uh, someone that hates men or whatever they might read books and they might really delve into it a lot more than just taking information from the news little bits of information uh, or, or from their like day-to-day -day life or their daily experience they might really delve into it but when we're dealing with ourselves we don't need to read books about ourselves because we're here you're here now so 
So if you want to focus on something, maybe focus on the kindness within you. By the way, when I say you don't need to read books, I'm not saying, you know, just talking about there are no books on you. That's what I meant by that. Unless there are, of course. So that's it, really. We get what we focus on, which is a standard thing. You know, if you're going to walk with a tray of glasses across a restaurant and all you're thinking about is I'm going to drop them, I'm going to drop them, I'm going to drop the tray, I'm going to drop the tray. There's a chance you're going to drop the tray. You know, there's a more chance of to- dropping the tray than if you weren't thinking that. If you go into an exam thinking I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail, or if you go saying I think I'm, I'm going to pass, I'm going to pass. I'm going to remember everything I need to remember. Whichever way you think can have a huge effect on the result of that exam. So it's kind of making a choice. Choosing to think a certain way. Choosing to think differently. Realising that your brain is plastic. Your brain has the ability to change not just your thoughts and not just as an idea oh I can change your idea you know that's a nice idea no but actually physically change organically change you know it's not just a, an idea not just your mind it's physically your brain is physically changing and it's growing So if you focus on something, your brain is going to be focused on that. And your brain will activate and be stimulated by that. Which means perhaps we can take more notice of what we focus on. And focus on feeling relaxed. Focused on... Just focus on all the lovely things that have happened to you. I know this the old thing is, you know, all wearing rose tinted glasses and there's that mocking. People that are nice tend to get mocked. People that look on the bright side of life tend to get mocked. Or oh, Pollyanna. Oh, it's always positive. But you know what? That person is going to be happier. Or at least open up more possibility of happiness for themselves. And probably for other people as well. So that's it really for this recording. Just to let you know that what I learned, I thought I passed that on. And it fits together with the whole idea of what we think about. We get what we think about get more of it so if you focus on relaxing you focus on you know things that are going to happen in the future and feeling relaxed that's what your mind starts to do and not only does it affect your unconscious mind your actual your brain actually changes and the more you do that the more your brain changes if you do it once, your brain might think, oh, it's just not going to take much notice. But if you keep doing it, that's when your brain starts to notice and your brain starts to change to accommodate that thought. It's almost like it builds a new house for that thought. Oh, well, you know, it's like I've noticed you're visiting a lot. So, uh, why don't you build a house here why don't you have a home here maybe you want to stay in the spare room for now you keep visiting you know instead of staying in the caravan or sleeping in your car stay in the spare room I've emptied the room out there's a little bed in there you can stay there for now and then you know there's room in the garden the bottom of the garden a bit of space Um, we can make a home for you 
we part of the community with the rest of the positivity. Right, I'm going to go. So thank you for listening. I'll leave those thoughts with you. Remember, the more you think about something, the more you think about it. And I'm talking about positive stuff, but it also works with the negative stuff as well. So it means we need to focus on the positive stuff. It changes. Not just how we think, but the brain itself. Remember to be kind to yourself because you deserve to be happy. Have a great weekend. Lots of love. Bye.